Okay, um, first of all, some common error that we saw during the break uh, about the require statement that we uh, used uh, to uh, load the, the JJS library in the past. Uh, um, you cannot use it anymore because require is a function which is available only in the Node.js library. So require is used in Node.js when you need to load modules. Uh, in the browser, it's, it's not a standard, uh, let's say, API, and so it's not supported in the browsers. Uh, right now, we don't need uh, to use require to load the module because uh, in the HTML, we directly loaded it uh, and processed it in this way. So instead of uh, having one JavaScript file load another JavaScript file, we load all, all that we need beforehand in the browser. Um, there will be an, another mechanism uh, in uh, the standard mechanism for importing modules, which is based on the import statement, not the required function that uh, uh, we will use in React and that will work in the browser. So for the moment, uh, just try to remove the uh, required call because it's not, it's not supported in the browser and it's not needed if we preload the, the content directly in the web page. Um, and next week, we'll start to see how the import works in conjunction with the uh, NPM, where we can download the modules. Mm. Uh, it's a bit more complex in the browser because with NPM, we download the modules locally, and then this JavaScript should be sent to the browser somehow. Mm. So it's not uh, something you can do uh, you know, by hand. OK. So but our, our goal here is try to uh, Attach this code not just to the loading of the page, but to any event that may happen. Hmm? Uh, we said more than once that uh, the JavaScript environment in the browser is highly asynchronous, uh, and this asynchronous behavior uh, is uh, so uh, managed through events. So an event is an object that is created uh, every time something happens of different types. So we have a type of event that is associated to the reason why this event has been created. Uh, the click, uh, the movement of the mouse, uh, the loading of an image, or whatever. Events normally, as I said before, coming from the user action, actions or from the network. And an event is generated normally by one element of the page. So if I click on a button, that button will generate uh, one event event of type click or actually two or three events associated with that but we don't want to mention the details right now if i enter some something in a text area that text area will generate the change event okay something changed inside me and so there will always be one element or always mostly be one element uh, that is responsible for creating the event that generated the event okay in the terminology of JavaScript, uh, the element that creates the event is called the event target. Uh, I would think it is as an event source where the event starts, but actually it's called target. Hmm? Don't blame me. So when we are calling about the event target, it means the uh, node that originated the event. Hmm? Okay. And what can we do? So these events are objects that are being automatically generated and normally discarded. What we can do is to register our own listener to some of these events and execute the code we want just by providing a callback function that will enter into the event loop. So, for example, uh, if I want to do something when a user pressed down the button, the mouse button, when in on a specific link. We could, of course, locate the object, the DOM node corresponding to the link or the links. In this case, it's only one because it's by ID. And to that node, we register a new event listener to one specific type of event. So the button can generate many types of events. We only want to listen on one specific category of events. And when this happens, I want to execute some code. The callback will receive one event object that will describe what happened, basically, and will execute this code every time the event is triggered. 
In this case, we have a specific event on a specific HTML element. We may have more generic event. You see that we are registering an event listener or the window global object. So there are more, the events of the window object are more related to the life cycle of the web page. So the page being loading, being terminated, the loading being terminated or something like that. So we have different types of events generated by different types of elements. But the general rule is that we can always attach our own event listener that will be added to the current event listener, re listeners uh, registered to that element. So every element may have more than one listener reacting to the same, uh, uh, to the same event. Um, we could also, if we wanted, let me go back to the browser, we see we saw in the in the console that for example we have this uh, so let me go to the inspector so we have for example const table equal to uh, document query selector table And we saw that any node has a, a list of uh, own properties. Okay, these own properties are all the possible even handlers or even listeners registered on this node. So what happens is that every time we see that in this example we register a mouse down a, a listener for the mouse down event, this would actually change the property on mouse down. So every node has a whole bunch of properties corresponding to all the possible events uh, that it may generate uh, according to the different type of actions. And if we set uh, one property here and in this one value to this property, instead of null, we set a function, this function will be called every time the event will happen. So one possibility could also to write uh, table dot on mouse down equal function to a function definition to an arrow function whatever you want. The preferred method is still using the add even listener method instead of just overwriting the on mouse down uh, property because uh, in this case we are overwriting any possible event tender that was registered before. If we set the property, we change the property. While the add event listener adds to the list. So it doesn't delete any previous uh, event tenders. So even if we can manipulate these properties directly because there are just properties whose value should be a function, it's better if we do that uh, with the registration function. Add event listener, remove event listener, and so on. Uh, the argument of the callback function is this event object. And this event basically contains two main properties. Some, some more, but the main ones are these two. One is the event.target that points directly to the HTML node that generates the event. So we know who's the, uh, who's the element uh, that where the element happens. So if you are 20 buttons in the page, you are registered uh, uh, the, the same, could be the same event tender to all of the buttons. Then every time I receive an event, I can uh, query event.target and understand which button was pressed because it will point to the node uh, that originated the event. And type is the type of event. So uh, you click and so on. In many cases, the, we don't need to inspect this because we already know what happened when a callback was found, was uh, was uh, kind of triggered. But uh, if we are registering one generic event tender to a lot of nodes, uh, then maybe we need to query that. Hmm? And uh, what kind of events can be generated? Okay, I, that's a very long list of all types uh, of events, all type of actions. Uh, this is a table from Wikipedia, just a bit more easy to browse, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge table anyway. 
there are mouse events of all types uh, probably the one which is more interesting is the click event but you see we have all the uh, movements of the click a click is made of a down followed by an up so if you want to separate uh, in so to do something when user clicks down something else when user release the button you can uh, listen to these two events or if you are only interested to the whole action of a click you just can listen to the click event we have the double click somewhere here we have the mouse over so when the mouse enters over the area of an element or mouse leave when uh, uh what is that let's leave somewhere i don't see it uh maybe they forgot it um when the user is dragging something is doing the action of dragging so dragging user if you drag something on an html page it normally doesn't move unless there's some javascript code that reacts to this action and does something to the elements and change the position so all the you know, uh, small movements of the mouse can be captured captured all the movement of the keyboard we uh, a key press Typing A is made of a key down of A and a key up of A itself. And the combination of the two is a key press. Normally, the, we are more interested in a full key press event. But if we need to, maybe if you are doing some video game, and so pressing and releasing are two separate, separate actions that need to be um, you know, uh, dealt differently. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of int very interesting uh, they will be interesting for us all the events generated on html forms so on the input element checkboxes and so on that will constitute most of our uh, interaction with the with the system okay uh, and basically the change event uh, is the one that is most interesting when something changes inside the text box uh, and the submit event uh, also when uh, uh, the full form is submitted to the user and uh, okay more or less other elements about the, the, the life cycle uh, another interesting event is load the load event uh, that is uh, generated directly by the window when the loading of the page is finished if you want to execute some code after the page has been completely loaded we should uh, this this event is fired only once per page when the page is finished loading it fires this event and then the page goes live and generates all the types of events. Uh, so there are really you can really uh, you know, customize every behavior, every detail of the behavior of the application. Uh, just be aware that some actions, some even tenders are already defined huh, on the page. For example, we have a link. By default, a link with a no, an a tag. By default, if I click on a link, uh, the browser will go to a different page. It's, it's nature. Uh, imagine we want to do something else with the link. So if the user clicks on a link, maybe we open a pop-up or something else. We can do that. We had an even, an even listener for the click event on the link itself. But then we need to avoid that, this, uh, that the browser goes to the other page. Otherwise, uh, the browser will execute my even listener followed by the, def uh, by the default action of going to a different page. So when we are uh, processing some, ty some type of events that already have a default behavior, we want probably to disable the default behavior. And uh, doing that uh, is easy because inside our handler, we, we, which will be executed before the default one, we can just call the prevent default uh, method. Mm -hmm. There's a, a whole propagation of the event from the generation to the, all the possible handlers that receive it. And it's a complex issue. I don't want to uh, spend time on that. Uh, but the event may be processed by all the container elements. And uh, uh, we can say to the browser, OK, we are done processing this event. Don't do anything more. Okay, the default behavior should be prevented. Don't let the browser execute the default behavior according to this action. Okay? 
and um, and just remember basically if you are uh, deciding what to do on a submit button or on a link, uh, uh, just remember. Otherwise, the the browser will navigate outside your page, mm -hmm. and you will be killed. About the HTML page, the most interesting ones are the events that happen when the page is loaded. Uh, we already are using the defer mechanism for executing some code synchronously after page load. But this is not the best practice. The best practice would be to write some code, like we did for populating the table, and specify that this, that code will be needs to be executed when the page is loaded. So we are not relying on the loading process of the browser, but we are explicitly linking an action to an event. And there are two different events that can be uh, listened to. One is the load event, and the other is a DOM content loaded. One is defined on window, and the other is defined on the document object. There are different event targets for these different types of events. What is the difference between the two? Load is the final event. Everything is ready on the page. The HTML has been loaded, the DOM has been created, all the external resources, style sheets, uh, images, and stuff has been loaded. We are done. The browser is done with the page. And it generates the load page, the load event. This may happen if a, if a page loses a lot of external resources, this may happen quite late in time. There's a sooner moment in time when the DOM is ready. So first the browser reads the HTML and builds the DOM. And then maybe it understand, the browser understands that the DOM calls in for external resources, style sheets and images, basically. This can be loaded asynchronously after the DOM is ready. So if we want our code to execute when the page is complete with all the images and everything, we associate our code to the load event. If our page, our code need, just needs to be able to manipulate the DOM of the page, and we don't care if, if some image is still loading, okay? There will be, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't interfere with our work, we don't need to have this image ready, then we can run our code sooner by uh, executing it on the content load event, which is the normal, Normal case. Yes? So we, are, we will uh, try to uh, execute our code only after the HTML page has been loaded and the DOM has been built for the HTML page. Okay? Then the browser basically stops doing their work, doesn't, doesn't have any, anything more to do, and start processing events. Uh, if I'm uh, listening to this event, I can run my code when the HTML is uh, finished loading. Okay? And this code runs. Usually it should be short-lived, do some actions, and then my callback will finish. The browser goes back to do nothing until another event happens, and then we'll run a different callback. So after the initial loading of the page, the browser basically sits down and waits for user events. Some user events will have listeners associated, and so we'll execute the call for these events. Is that what you're being asking? And uh, so normally the browser is happy in doing nothing, unless we are doing something, and then the browser will need to react to our actions. So, like I was saying, the best practice should not be just to execute this code in the main.js. Usually, we should minimize, because this runs synchronously, okay? Uh, this should, we should always try to put all the processing into asynchronous callbacks. So what we should do when the browser loads the page is just to register the intention of doing something when the, load is, uh, when the DOM is loaded. 
So instead of executing the code here, normally what they would do is to register a document dot so not document flag document dot add event listener and the type of event would be done content loaded sorry I never DOM content loaded string DOM content loaded and I associate some code to be executed when the DOM is loaded. What is this code? Well, basically the code I just wrote. So the body of this callback is what we just did. I move it, cut and paste. Yeah. Just speaking about the space. So nothing should change right now. We just move our code that was executing synchronously when the script code uh, was encountered, basically, and was deferred at the end of the body. Now the same code is executed whenever the DOM finished loading. The browser finished loading the DOM. So let me try to save it and load it, see that if everything is still working. Yeah. Uh, there's a little flash here. If I load, see that the, the, the table is flashing. In fact, our code now is executing a bit later than before. Before, we didn't see it flashing because the loading of the page and the rendering of the page was blocked by my code. And so I modified the DOM before it was ever shown to the user. Right now, I'm waiting for the browser to finish rendering the page, and then I modify it. Okay? Of course, this only happens because we have some previous content in the table. Normally, I would start with an empty table, I wouldn't see all of this. But just for seeing the, the small difference. So if we look at the synchronous code that the browser is running, it's only this instruction. The, sorry, let, let's remove this comment. The browser synchronously only runs this one instruction. I'm registering a listener. So I'm very quick. I don't delay the loading of the page or any other action from the browser. Then when the browser tells me everything is ready, I do my work, which is I replacing some part of the DOM. Hmm? So that's what I meant when I said that 99% of my code runs inside event handlers. The only code, generally, that runs outside event handlers is uh, the code for registering new event handlers. At least one at the beginning of the page. Okay? So, okay, right now we, we, we didn't change anything, we just... Uh, um, they moved the execution of the code to an asynchronous thread instead of to a synchronous uh, uh, one. Now we want to actually modify the behavior and add the um, delete button to my table. Okay, so there are many ways to, of doing that. We could uh, uh, add one further column here, down here, with the next button that when clicks should delete the line, okay? An icon or a button or whatever. Hmm? So we need to modify the code that creates this table to create also the button, not just the content. So this means a little, some HTML work because we need to 
add the further column to the header, let's say th, uh, let's call it um, actions, for example. And we need to add one further column to each of the rows that may be a button. So there's a button uh, with an X inside. There's a button element in HTML that simply creates a button. Of course, uh, we should then apply maybe some uh, um, bootstrap style to this button. Okay. And these are special uh, one of the elements that are being used to, for forms. Uh, another equivalent way would be to use the input element uh, of type button. So we may use the button element or the input type equal to button, and they actually create the same the same uh, interface. Mm -hmm. uh, but the easiest one is is this one. And uh, so let me see in the HTML. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm not able to see it. Because if I load the page, uh, whatever I write will be will be rewritten. OK. So you see for one millisecond one x that appeared here in the, in the, static, in the static page. So Let's forget about this static table. I have new, a new column, so I will modify the code for generating the rows of the table. And maybe I decide to remove completely the body. Let's start with an empty body. That's easier that we reduce the flashing and the starting point for our code. For our code. So with our table, we start with an empty body. Because the body is, will be filled by the JavaScript code. And in the JavaScript, we uh, must remember to add uh, another column which contains this button. And so I'm, I'm appending to the inner HTML a further point. Uh, let's see if it works. Sorry, the browser is here. No, did I save it? No, sorry. Let me save it and save the HTML. Go to the browser, reload. Okay, I have these very ugly buttons. If I don't like them, I, okay, I just ask Bootstrap. He's telling me that uh, I should have this. It's a delete, so let's make it danger. Type button, plus button danger. And uh, I generate it from here. Maybe it's a little less terrible to see. Oh, let's also, since we are here, format the data in a more <laughs> compact way. But format year month days. Okay. So we just built the interface elements, in this case, two buttons. That will execute some action for me. Right now, the buttons are doing the work of a button. So we, I can click them, and they do nothing. I need to associate a behavior to the click action on that button. So I need to add an even listener to this button. For adding an even listener, I need to reference to the node that I'm creating, to the button node, 
and then I can create, I can add one callback. So where is the node? Where is the button node? It's here. I'm, cre I'm not creating it by code. I'm creating it by string, but I need to have actually the code. But I can extract the code by querying the TR node. TR, give me the button that you have inside. So for example, may I may have the button. Button X is TR. Give me the element that matches the button. You only have one. If we had more than one button, of course, we should uh, refine the squeeze selector to select the first or the second or the third one, depending on the value, depending on an attribute, on an ID, or on a class. We need, of course, to differentiate, differentiate them in some way. And if I write this button with an X, uh, is a node oh, to which I can add even an event listener of the event called click. And there we go. Inside here, we write the code that will be executed when the button is pressed. This up and child may happen before or later, but we don't care. Okay, these instructions are independent from that. We prepare the, the table row and we are customizing the content of this table row. And later on, we are applying. So we can add this customization before or after the row has been appended to the body. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. Okay. We still have the reference to the object. Um, so what do we want to do here? For the moment, let's just check what ha what's happening. Okay. So we have uh, console.log. We may write something like uh, delete button, delete uh, exam. So we are logging this message just to check whether our code is working. Again, this is a synchronous call. So we wrote it here at line 31, but it will not be executed when we execute the, the surround, surrounding code. Okay. This code in HTML, append child, is executed when the DOM is loaded. And then we are creating a node and associating an event listener to this node that will be called, maybe it will be called later if and only when the user clicks on the button. So if everything is right, I can reload it. And can try to click here. And it's right in the message. And if, if I click more, the, the console will tell me, OK, this message has been printed four times. Okay, So if I'm repeating the same message in an, in an identical way, the console tries to come compact the messages and just increase the number. Later on, OK, but which exam, which exam should we delete? How does it know? Well, we know. We know that this is the exam name. Inside this, we are inside this for each where we are generating the row. So why I'm generating the row, I know very well which is the exam that I need to delete. And so with a little closure, I can remember this information. So for example, the, the exam interpolation exam dot code. So inside this callback, I may have a closure over this exam variable that I'm looping over. And so the callback itself will remember the code of the exam 
that it needs to delete. Um, every button, every X button, I have two of them, gets its own copy of the event handler. They are different functions. Every time I get here, I'm, I'm looping twice here in this for each. Every time I'm creating a new file, a new arrow function with a closure over a different value of the exam. OK? So in this case, if I run the code, I should be able to see that the first button remembers to delete an exam with a given code, and the second button remembers to delete uh, an exam with a different code. OK? And so on. So every, if I go and inspect an element, uh, inspect this button here, I should be able to see uh, show the DOM properties of the node to see that we have a non click. Uh, oh, it's not. What did I expect? Okay, so maybe it's not, it doesn't show it here. Sorry. It works, but it doesn't show. It's somewhere else. OK. Um, OK. Never mind. Now we need to really delete the, delete the row. Hmm? What should we do? Well, we should probably delete the data from the table, and then, so from the array list, and then regenerate the table. It's easier than that. We should not just delete the row, because otherwise the data in the, in the array list will remain. So at this point, uh, we, what we can do is to execute some code to delete uh, an element from the table and then regenerate this table. Uh, so I could just replace the array list uh, with a filter operation. I'm filtering away the element with the right code. So it, what remains are all the other elements. So I could do exam, uh, what was the name? Exams. Exams, so I'm doing another closure for remembering the reference to the full exam list. Uh, I take in the exam list property. OK, maybe the exam list already has a delete uh, method. If it doesn't, uh, I'm just doing it right now, dot uh, equal to x. I replace it with, uh, by filtering it for all the, I'm just retaining all the exam whose code uh, is different uh, from my exam code. Okay, you want to print this? I make you happy. So, when I click on an event, I know which exam I should delete because I know the code. And I will delete it from the list uh, exam list, which is the main list huh, that contains all the exams. And now I want probably to regenerate uh, the table. So I would need to re execute all this code, which is not easy to do right now. We need to a bit to reorganize it. Uh, as a group of functions. Okay, so let's say regenerate. So let's first check at the data level if the operation succeeds in the in the debugger. 
so we load the page in the console we should be able to see the uh, exams okay it's not very because it's only defined inside so let me go into the debugger and inside this code And we cannot inspect this variable because we are not in this context. But we could, uh, for example, set a breakpoint uh, here when the user clicks on the button on the inside even listener. So we know that the table is running, has been created. When I click on this button here, Okay, I'm posing a breakpoint, and I can see uh, that I have some exam variable. So it's a bit strange now because I'm stopped inside an event and a synchronous event tender that has its own scope, but it also can access uh, the scopes of uh, the enclosing functions. And since I am at three levels deep in the function list, I have three contexts that, we, that, that are part of the closure of this function. But basically what I should do is that you should be able, not right now, to see the exams because I'm blocked into a scope that has access to this list. Okay? It contains two elements. Good. This is what I wanted to see. Then I go on with the execution, console.log, and then the code will filter. Exam list is not defined. OK, so there's something wrong here. Uh, exam list is not defined. Uh, exam list, exams, oh, okay, so exams uh, dot exam list dot filter. Because it's a property of the list. Mm -hmm. I have the same name for too many things. Okay, so again, the point has been remembered from before, even if the JavaScript has been reloaded. I execute this filter, and what I see is that uh, now the exams contains only one element. So I was actually able to remove one element from the list. Unfortunately, this is still shown in the table here. So I need to reorganize the code a little better. So maybe let's create one function just to create the table, and another function for deleting it or something like that. Hmm? But it just re reorganizes the code because I need to reuse the same code for generating the table at least twice. Once at the beginning, and once every time, and once every time I click on the button, or in general, every time I change the content of the table. So uh, let's create a new a function. We can define it also at the global level. Function generate table. It takes a list of exams as an argument. We are not adding a code to be executed at the top level because the only instruction will be just a function definition. We are not slowing down the program. So we could define the function inside even listener, but maybe for making it clearer, it's better to separate the function definition from the actual code. And where we Basically, copy this part of the code from here to there. Maybe it works. Uh, so, extract the body, purge several element uh, cycles of the on the exams, which now is a parameter of this function. We have no global web variables anywhere. And uh, creating the selector and so on. 
and uh, let me just check uh, i have this open brackets brace does it match probably not this for lease okay it's missing closing brace yeah okay so this uh, Generate exams goes here. Okay, there's stuff down here that I don't need anymore. A given listener this is the body of the even listener, and of course here I need to call the function for. It's called generate table of exams. This is still something that's some syntax that is wrong here. So uh, for each, uh, oh. so I did something. This is the body of the for each. We should close here. And then I should close the parentheses of the for each. Right? Yeah, like this. No, it works. Okay. No, this is my okay. Oh, it's okay. It's just the linter that all the syntax should be okay. So I just moved the code inside this generate table function. And the function is actually executed called at the DOM content load event. Nothing should change. Let me check. Except uh, there's some syntax error. Main.js line 32. Did I save it? OK. It was uh, executed in, in, a preview, in an old version. I didn't save it. OK, so everything is like before. So now, but now, after re, uh, filtering out the code, I can call the function for generating the table. Create, what the name? Generate table with the new exams uh, that now contain one less element. So after I you know, clean up the list, I regenerate the table with the new version of the list. So if I reload this page, I can try to delete the first one. And something is wrong. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. And it goes. And it goes. Of course, if I reload the page, everything, the, the deletion is not permanent, of course. When I refresh, everything will be reloaded from scratch. By the way, uh, this is not a recursion. We have a call of generate table inside the function generate table but we are not creating a recursive function here because this code is not executed in the context of this function or during the call of this function this code will be scheduled later if and when the user clicks on the button and so the generate table function will be executed synchronously in the body of this event listener, synchronous to this body of the event listener, or synchronous to this body of this event listener. That is, and these two event listeners are called, so there's no path in which the generate table function calls itself. 
the, the calling the generate table function will just create new event listeners. I need to recreate this event listener because I'm recreating the table. But I'm not calling the function itself. So it's a bit of complex to keep track of uh, what runs when. OK? That's a lot of the life, because we have to work with the, within the context of what the DOM will provide us. And so we have to do everything in an incremental way. If I wanted to do a, a cleaner programmer, instead of regenerating the table, imagine the table has 50 rows, 200 rows. We are throwing every, every, everything just to delete one row. Well, it's not so efficient. So I should probably, in parallel, delete the data from the data structure and delete the row from the table, from the DOM, just removing the DOM node corresponding to the TR so that the browser will only have to delete one line instead of recreating the table and all the data and all the even listeners from scratch. It's uh, hard to keep track of what is happening and hard to keep in sync different uh, type of information. Imagine if we wanted also to have in the page uh, a number here, a cell at the bottom, with the average of our scores. It's not difficult. We have the method for computing the average in our uh, uh, exam list. When we create the table, we just add one row with the value. Maybe in the table footer, so that it that doesn't get deleted or, or, uh, or changed. Or in a second body, so we can have different bodies and every we can regenerate. So we can have one cell that with a persistent value. But we should remember that every time we change the data, we should recreate this table. We should and also we should update the average. We should remember for every action which are the pages, the parts of the page that are affected, and remember to change all of them. There's nothing automatic here. So we will have a lot of several little functions. One will be compute at the average, and they will compute and uh, update the average on the part of the page. Mm -hmm. If you want, we can do it very easy. We can, for example, okay, add the, after the body a footer of the page uh, of the table, sorry, where we have one empty table, the uh, date, sorry, one empty cell. below the name of the course, and then a second cell with the ID average, where we are going to inject the average value. And then we add our two empty cells. Okay, we are adding an empty row. If I load the page, this is the empty row that we have. We have this table data with an ID, so it will be easy to pick, to find from the JavaScript code. And so every time the table is changed, so we go into the JavaScript, every time we change the table, we update the average. So we define a function update average that receives the list of exams. With, a, with an S, and we compute the uh, exams dot. Uh, what is called? What is called average? I don't remember. Exam list uh, average. Yes. This uh, exam average, and then we put this value inside uh, the right cell. That should be in document, dot query selector, or get element by ID is the same, because right now we have the ID. Query selector, we use the, we'll add the function later. 
um, we need to remember the hash sign when you are we are selecting an ID. Dot uh, um, in the text. Or text. Let's continue the same. Equal to average. Maybe. And we, I must remember to call this function whenever I change the table. So after all these for each, once here, update, average, exam. So let's see if it works. Yeah. If I delete one of them, the average is recomputed. This is easy because it was synchronous. But imagine, and we are linked the computation of the average to the regeneration of the table. But imagine if you are if if we have other operations on the table, maybe we can edit the score. So every time we edit the score, we need to remember to call the function update average. It will compute it, will update the page, but we we must remember to call it. Okay, there's a lot of control that we need to make. Uh, to keep everything in sync. Hmm? I'm pointing out these problems because these are the kind of problems that React is going to solve for us. Okay. It's something that, in an easy example, okay, we can manage them, but if the page becomes more complex, it's very easy to forget something and not to remember where the data uh, really is. Okay, So I'm passing around the exam function across function, so every every component basically Remember these exams. I don't want to put it into uh, global variables, but also passing it around functions is not the best way. Actually, the exam list is defined here. We are only one point where, it's where the object is created. But then a lot of different parts of the page, parts of the functions, need to access this data structure. So I'm still passing around every time. Maybe we are. We start using the terms that we use uh, in React. Uh, there's the content of the page, there's the DOM, that in a way uh, is computed starting from the state information. Uh, this is actually the, 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 the model that contains the information for creating the page. So in a way, we should always update the state and update the page according to the new value of the state. Hmm? Okay. Uh, and this is uh, basically the philosophy of working with the DOM. If we want to do something more complex, maybe we need uh, not just buttons, but also something more uh, sophisticated, like uh, all, all the forms. Okay. We didn't use forms yet because we just had one button for deleting but if we want to insert a new element uh, we can uh, use some uh, in, uh, new control new input element for example we have a there is a tag called input that creates a, a text box where the user can insert the data the interesting part uh, okay is not just the html for creating forms it's uh, very easy uh, but what we see from the event point of view, from the JavaScript point of view, we have a node that contains an attribute called value. So this node point value will, in every moment, uh, always contain the, the text that the user has actually typed. And if we change in JavaScript the value of an input text, uh, the actual text written there will change. So if you want to insert something, I can create some input elements uh, and then read the value and use it for creating a new exam, for example. Okay. Um, there are several types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, input elements uh, that are listed here. And they mainly depend. Uh, uh, the simple one is a, is a, um, a text. Uh, but we may have a number, for example, 
that only constrains the type of input to be numbers, or a date that constrains the type of input and pops up a calendar when you want to insert something. And so the browser will help you in a way to, to enter the data. Uh, by the way, the different browsers are rendering this type of advanced control in a different way. So they're not totally 100% compatible or identical, but basically they work in the same way. There are some attributes that we may use to control, for example, whether a given form element is enabled or disabled. So we cannot enter data in a, in a, in a we, we want to show the element, but not, we don't want to let the user edit it, for example. So we, are, we disable it or we make it read only. Hmm? Um, and this, are, of course, is for, for managing you know, the interaction between the different control elements. All of these properties, we see them as HTML attributes, but we remember that 99% of the times we will be uh, working with these properties on the JavaScript side. And uh, I don't want to go into details about uh, all the HTML forms because it's just, just HTML. The, the interesting part uh, comes where we understand how the forms behave from the JavaScript point of view. So when a user is interacting with some form element, what may happen? Oh, well, form elements may generate different types of events that are more or less listed here. Uh, the important one is usually the change event, where the element informs me that something has been changed. Usually, I'm not interested, if the user is typing something in a, in a field, I'm not interested in every keystroke of the user. I could get that through the key press event, or it could get that through the input event that is called every key press of the user. But do I, do I really care? I usually care when the whole value has been changed. So a checkbox has been checked, uh, an input has been finished, uh, a text has been finished, a, cell, um, a drop down has been selected, and so on. And that will generate one, only once the change event with a new value. Well, no, we not with the new value, from which I could extract the new value by reading the value attribute of the input element. Uh, it's fired only when the element loses the focus, and when the mouse of the user goes away. So I, I have some value to check, to validate, or to use. Or mostly, most in many cases, we just, I just need to read the values of an element when a button is clicked, when the submit button is clicked. So uh, usually we add even listeners if we need on the change event of uh, the various elements, and of course on the submit button where we should do the real action. Um, okay, this is an example of just to show in the difference between the two. If we are uh, Handling the submit button of the form, we should also remember the prevent default method because we don't want the form to be really submitted to somewhere. We don't know even where because we are just using the submit function, the submit button to uh, to activate our own code. Huh? And so we should prevent the, the default the default action. So this is the. Uh, the same ideas also apply when we are working with forms. Uh, the difference is that form tends to generate more events uh, and tends to have uh, uh, more, more properties. Okay. Uh, I, let's try to use just two minutes uh, to add uh, not the full uh, version, but only one part. Uh, let's imagine, oh, I, uh, here I have an HTML problem because I forgot the row. Because we could also add one other row in the footer here, for example, to the interface for adding you know, a new exam. So it could be an input that equal to text uh, name or name exam name. is this and when we have a second input for the score and third input for the date number date exam score exam date 
and then we may have a add button. So a button like button with a plus, something like that. Okay, may generate something like this. Okay, we need to start the button with bootstrap, but okay, there are details. So we have some HTML elements, but you see the spinner here because uh, it's a number, the free text here, and the calendar that pop ups here, which is the normal behavior of these input elements. And what happens when I click on this button, I should add an even listener on the clicks of this button that will just gather the value here, the value here, and the value there, and use them for creating a new exam and adding it to the list. And then we should regenerate the table again that will redraw everything, add one line, and update the, the average score. So the idea is always the same. Uh, there will be some. Um, there are also some attributes, for example, in this number, we have a minimum and maximum value that we, we can set. So that help, the browser will help us you know, in uh, uh, entering va valid data. There's a required attribute that makes the, the field mandatory and so on. But the real action will be in the event handler of, of this button. OK? So I don't want to keep you here uh, after the end of the, of the, of the class. Uh, you know, you have to move. So maybe I will complete these three lines uh, behind this plus button. Um, and so I will share the code with you, and you can have a look. But the idea is just the, the same. Okay, collect the data from the value attribute of the input elements. So I find uh, with the document uh, uh, get element, uh, get query selector or something, I find this element, and I get the, the value. The value will be a string, which is exactly the string that the user typed there. And then I call the function, or we generate a table, and so on. OK? In, on Thursday, so I will share the final version of this exercise. And on Thursday, we'll, you will do the same, basically, with the list of, list of movies exercise that we have been doing. OK? So that's all for today. Thank you.